You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. Always appreciate you guys spending some time with us. want to remind you, make sure you jump on iTunes, subscribe to the podcast so you can hear all the amazing stories that we have to tell you. Also, leave a rating and a review. That helps us out. Get the word of the podcast out there. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites. We are on Facebook at Hazard Ground Podcast. Instagram is the same, Hazard Ground Podcast, and on Twitter at Hazard Ground. Reminder, our website is live, hazardground.com. You can get previous episodes, more pictures, bios, photos of our guests, and a lot of other great additional content that's not necessarily in every episode each week. This week's episode is brought to you by our new sponsor, Patagonia Clothing and Outdoor Gear. You've probably seen the ubiquitous mountain landscape Patagonia logo on a jacket or a pair of shorts or the occasional mesh hat or knit beanie. But the story behind those products runs much deeper than just a logo. Patagonia was founded out of a love for adventure and the outdoors. Their incredibly well-built products and impeccable customer service keeps you moving from adventure to adventure without skipping a beat. And if in the off chance something does go wrong, through Patagonia's ironclad guarantee, you could send them back to Patagonia for repair or replacement, no questions asked. Patagonia stands behind every product they make 100%. So whether you're into fishing, hiking, climbing, surfing, or just need a good rain jacket, backpack, or travel gear, find the sustainable and ironclad solution at Patagonia. Trust me on this one, you will not be disappointed. Again, guys, every sponsor on Hazard Ground is a product that we've used and stand by 100%. We wouldn't waste your time talking about it otherwise. So get on over to www.hazardground.com slash sponsors and click on the Patagonia banner for free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Remember, support for our sponsors goes right back into making the Hazard Ground the best show it could possibly be. Again, that's hazardground.com slash sponsors. Click on the Patagonia banner and get moving to your next adventure. This week's guest has not one, but two Purple Hearts. He's a retired E5 in the Marine Corps. Sergeant Jim Hackett joins us on the Hazard Ground podcast. Jim, welcome. Great to speak with you. Hey, Mark. It's great to be with you as well, too. Thanks for the opportunity to chat you up a little bit. Listen, we are excited. Anytime we get a chance to get Vietnam vets on, uh, it's always a pleasure of ours in, in this whole process of doing this Hazard Ground podcast. You know, it was it was tough to find you guys. It was tough to find Vietnam vets who were willing to come forward and speak and tell their story and we're so thankful that you guys do that. So we certainly appreciate you joining us uh, here on the Hazard Ground. But let's start way back at the beginning and tell us how you got your start in the Marine Corps. Well, uh, my father was a Marine in World War II. I come from a, a long tradition of military service, but I'll start with my dad. He uh, he was a newspaper man in 1939 with uh, the Associated Press and uh, got out of school and had a degree in journalism, decided to... Uh, hang out in New York, and he was uh, working as uh, as a bureau chief in New York City when the Japanese attacked in 1941. So he went down and marched himself down to the recruiting office and uh, enlisted the Marine Corps. Uh, dragged him down to Paris Island, they found out that he had a college degree. They said, okay, we need officers, but we can't make you an officer just yet, so you're going to be a drill instructor here at Paris Island. He got through boot camp, and uh, so I basically grew up with a drill instructor as a father. Um, <laughs> he was, uh, quite, uh, quite an influence on my life, that guy. Uh, anyway, he, uh, wound up, uh, picking up a platoon in New River, uh, North Carolina, taking him over to the Pacific and spent about three years in combat in the Pacific. Wow. Uh, did fairly well for himself, but he did. He, uh, wound up, uh, as a captain, uh, on Okinawa, his final battle. He, uh, did Bougainville, uh, Okinawa, right? This is not in chronological order. Peleliu. He was involved in Peleliu, which is a horrendous battle in the Marine Corps. Uh, Bougainville, and then finished up in Okinawa. And if it wasn't for Harry Truman, I wouldn't be here right now because he was prepping to go and hit the shores of Japan uh, when they were prepping for the invasion of Japan when they dropped the bomb. So he was able to uh, weasel out of that, if you will. Uh, But he stayed in the Marine Corps. And he had a girlfriend back home. Uh, It turned out she became my mother. But how he won her... He uh, was an intelligence officer. He was a wheeler dealer type of guy in the Marine Corps. I always had that admiration for him. And while he was on uh, the island of Bougainville, they had a they had a lake that they were trying to name. It was a taboo lake that natives wouldn't go anywhere near it. So he said, "Well, uh, let's la- name it after my girlfriend in uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Let's call it Lake Kathleen." 
So being the weasel kind of a guy he was, he called up one of his buddies who was the Associated Press. And the next thing my mother knew, uh, photographers and reporters were on our doorstep saying, hey, Marine Hero names the lake after girlfriend in, in Bougainville. So to this day, there is a lake somewhere in that uh, island in the Pacific named after my mother. Wow. Anyway, they uh, they got hooked up. They got married. He stayed in the Marine Corps about 1947 got out and went into the reserves and uh, worked his way up to lieutenant colonel. So in 1956, my earliest rec uh, recollections of the Marine Corps, on the weekends, and uh, he would go out to his drill stuff. And during the summers, we'd go down to Quantico, Virginia, and I just loved to make him drive through the sentry post to make the uh, poor Marine guy salute, salute my father's car. Every time he'd drive in and drive out, I got a big kick out of that. So I got a really early uh, inculcation into the into the lore of the Marine Corps from my father. And he literally would scream at me, get out of the rack, get out of the rack, get out of the rack. And this is when I was a young kid. So I was I was kind of ready to go in the Marine Corps, but I wasn't really sure I could really make it as a Marine. So in 1967, I was finishing up a little bit of community college. I wasn't doing too well, and the draft board was sending me letters, do you like to shoot? What size helmet do you wear? How do you feel about long ocean trips? And I said, geez, I, I'm going to get drafted here. This is not a good thing. So I went to my father and said, hey, Dad, listen, uh, you know, I'm going to get drafted. And I, I don't know what to do. He says, well, you'll never make it as a Marine. You're just a, it's a slug. You'll never do it. You, physically, you're not going to be able to make it. You're not, you're not a sports guy. You, you don't play ball very well. In fact, I used to catch fly balls with my forehead. I was so uncoordinated. <laughs> and so he said, <laughs> <laughs> you could never make it as a Marine. So I went down to the recruiting uh, place in New York City, and uh, they had big, long lines. And this is 1967 when the draft was starting to kick in, like about February of 67. And uh, they had a big, long line in front of the Army uh, table. And I went up to the Army guy, and I said, hey, uh, Sarge, if I join the Army, what do you do for me? He said, well, you know, forget about this Vietnam thing. We'll send you to Germany. There's lots of babes over there. You know, they got large breasts and they carry these big mugs of beer. You're really going to love it. So that sounds pretty good. So I went over to the Navy and I said, hey, uh, if I join the Navy, what do you do for me? And they go, well, uh, you know, uh, forget about this Vietnam thing. We'll put you on a, on a ship and you'll have three squares every day. You'll be, uh, it'll be great. It'll be great. Go to the Mediterranean, lots of babes. I said, that sounds pretty good and with the Air Force. I said, well, you know, your eyesight isn't that great. You're not going to be a pilot, but we'll make you a bombardier, and we've got golf courses and clubs, and you'll have a great old time. And I looked over the Marine Corps table, and there was nobody around it. And sitting behind the table was this bulldog-looking sergeant. I went up to him and said, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sergeant. Don't call me sergeant. I work for a living. I'm, uh, I'm, don't call me sir. I'm, I'm a sergeant. I go, okay, fine. Uh, you know, the Navy said I go to the Mediterranean. The, the Army says I can go to the <laughs> go to Germany, and the, the Air Force says I could be a pilot. If I join the Marine Corps, what do you do for me? So he looks me in the eye and he says, "We're not going to do nothing for you, boy, but kick your ass and make a man out of you." Okay, <laughs> where do I sign? That is fantastic. So that's how. That's how I got in the Marine Corps. And so this guy was pretty slick. This recruiting sergeant. When he uh, signed me for four years instead of two or three. Not bad. probably saved my butt. Well, I, I want to find out how it saved your butt, but I'm curious. Did, did, when you told your dad that exact story, what did he say? Uh, he laughed at me and he says, okay, here's what you got to remember. When you go to Paris Island, one thing you don't want to get is noticed. Don't get noticed by the drill instructor. Stay off in the corner. Just don't screw up. Don't do anything that's going to get you noticed because as soon as you get noticed, that's when you're going to get it. I said, okay, Dad, I'll follow, I'll follow everything he said. And the other thing he did for me, which was kind of cool, he brought back from World War II an M1 Garand rifle. So I knew how to shoot that rifle. He'd take me out to the range, and he taught me a little bit of how that, how that weapon functioned. And it was very similar to the M14, which was the rifle we were using in Paris Island at the time. So I knew my way around that rifle, but I wasn't much of an athlete. I couldn't run. I was not a big, bad kind of a guy. I never really enjoyed fist fights. I never got into it. So in 1967, when you got to Paris Island, if you've ever seen the movie Full Metal Jacket, the first sure, yeah. part of that movie is exactly, dude, I'm telling you, it was exactly what happened in my boot camp in Paris Island. A lot of stress, a lot of 
angst, a lot of screaming and yelling, and uh, a lot of words that they can't use now in basic training they used back in that day. Just don't tell so me. You, just don't tell me you were Gomer Pyle. <laughs> well, I wasn't Gomer Pyle, but I kind of looked kind of geeky because they okay. made me wear these glasses. I had to wear glasses because I my, my eyesight wasn't that great. And as soon as you put on on those Marine Corps issue glasses, yeah. I mean, I don't know what you had in the Army. We used to call them uh, BCDs, birth control devices. Yep. You put those things on. And Same thing, BCGs, birth control glasses. Yeah, that's what we called them in the Army. That's what it was. That's what it was. So, and for those listening I'm, who aren't familiar, I'm, because they were an automatic deterrent to any female. If you put these things on, you just looked ugly. So that, that's why they were called birth control glasses. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even, even the uniform, I mean, the Army uniforms look good, but I think the Marine Corps uniforms look pretty good as well. Sure, yeah. So I was looking forward to, to getting my getting myself under one of those and going out in the town, but uh, in boot camp that wasn't going to happen. So anyway, I, I managed to not get noticed up until a certain thing happened. My last name is Hackett, okay? And um, so one day uh, they would run the heck out of us, and I, we'd all learn how to sleep standing up. We'd all stand around while the drone instructor would yell at us, and that was the only way I could catch up with my sleep. I'd be half-conscious. So one day I'm standing there, and uh, the drone instructor's yelling at us, and he says, you know, you, you maggots, you maggots just can't hack it. So all I heard was hack it. Now, in the Marine Corps, when they call your last name, especially in boot camp, you've got to go, sir, Private Hackett. So I go, sir, Private Hackett. And you could hear a pin drop, and everybody's looking at me, and the drone instructor's looking at me, I said, what? He said, are you, what are you doing? I said, well, sir, Private Hackett. Then he got it. He said, oh, you're Hackett. You're Private Hackett. All right, you're Private Hackett. And I became Private Hackett. Private Hackett can't hack it. That's all I would hear through boot camp. So we get to the rifle range. And meanwhile, I'm getting all kinds of grief. And the drill instructor later killed in action. Um, great guy. My name is Staff Sergeant Rash. George Rash. It said to me, okay, it said to the platoon, okay, anybody, any little maggots out here who thinks you're, you're bad and you think you can be a Marine, I don't care how fast you can run. I don't care how many people you can beat up. I don't care if you can kick my butt. But if you can shoot that rifle, you're going to be the outstanding man in this platoon. You're going to get a dress blue uniform. Living Magazine magazine's going to give you an award. You're going to get a trophy for the high shooter. You're going to have your own house mouse, which means the smallest guy in the platoon makes your own rack. And you're going to be first guy into chow every day. So I get to the rifle range. And I remembered what my father taught me about shooting that M1. And I was able to outshoot everybody in the battalion. <laughs> wow. So I, uh, it was my crowning achievement in the Marine Corps. I think, so they found out Private Hackett man. could hack it. That's exactly what he said. Private Hackett can actually hack it. And uh, I, uh, the last couple of weeks in boot camp were glorious for me because I was first into chow. I got my beautiful dress blue uniform. It was very cool. And then came the day when they announced they announced the MOSs. I don't know what they did and what they do now, but back in my day, the big thing was being told what you're going to be doing in the Marine Corps, and that was your military occupational specialty. And in uh, March of 1967, uh, they were packing people on buses, and they were all O311s, which meant you were going right to the infantry. So it was a big ceremony. You're standing at attention in the squad bay, and the drill instructor's reading out your names, and he starts the first name, Adams, you're 0311. Hoorah! You're going to kill some commies for Christ. Hoorah! They get down to four, five, or six, seven, eight, ten names, 14 names, all infantry. He gets to my name, and he says, hack it. And there's a moment of silence. He goes, who do you know in headquarters Marine Corps? I go, sir, the private knows nobody. in the What the hell is a 5900? And we're all going, 15, what is that? He looks it up, electronics. I'm going to electronic school. To everybody's great consternation, and I was not going to Vietnam right away with the rest of my boys. I was going to San Diego to learn electronics. And they all looked at me, and they were all disappointed. They're going, Hackett, you're really letting me down. So I left Paris Island with a a job description of electronic school I had no idea what I was going to be doing. So off I go to, off I go to San Diego and I'd never been to California in my life before. 
And I started to look around. It's, you know, it's beautiful temperatures. There's babes. There's palm trees. I mean, it's great clubs. You can actually drink some beer. It was really a cool place. And uh, so I go to this electronic school. And they stand up and they say, okay, we've got 60 guys in this class. And you're all going to learn everything there is to learn about electronics. And if you don't learn it, we're going to make you an 0311. <laughs> and 59 of you guys out of the 60 are going to go to Vietnam and fix radios. The top guy is going to go to radar school. Radar school? What the, what the heck is radar school? Well, if, you, if you're if you the top guy, you'll find out the rest of you guys are going to Vietnam. So I – Buckle down. I never studied like this before in my life and, and got to be top guy in this electronic school. So I get to go to radar school. So off I go to 29 Palms in uh, outside of Los Angeles. It's about 60 miles in the desert. A terrible place, just an awful place. And I had to wait around almost three months until I got 10 Marines that were qualified to take this radar course. And it turns out I'm thinking radar. This is you know I've got it made. I'm gonna be sitting in a in a bunker. Okay, you're on the glide path. Uh, give me another beer, Bob. Uh, yeah, turn the air conditioning down. It's a little cold in here. I'm thinking I've got it made. So I come to find out it's not aviation radar. It's called ground surveillance radar. They had this new device that they came up with that the army came up with. Uh, it was called uh, a counter mortar radar. And this radar was uh, intended to be used in a fire base where they're getting mortars and rocket rounds, and it would track the ballistic projectile of the mortar or the rocket round. And using a bunch of slide rules and a bunch of other silly stuff, you'd be able to determine where the mortar tube was, call up the artillery or call for an airstrike or call, call naval gunfire and call in a fire mission. Okay, well, that sounds pretty cool. So I do this course, and they go, okay, the top three guys in this course are going to go to the secret school. The rest of you knuckleheads are going to go to Vietnam and see if you can find some mortars. <laughs> so like, oh, I went for the from an air ra aviation radar where I'm on the glide path, you know, give me a beer, you know, <laughs> let's do this. And now I'm tracking mortars. And I go, well, I, let's see if I can make this secret school thing well. Of the 10 guys in my class, four or five of them had electrical engineering degrees, so I was oh, no God. way I was going to be top guy in this class, dude. It was, it was ridiculous. So I'm, I'm studying. I'm trying to do the best I can. And wouldn't you know, two or three guys get ill. One guy gets – he has a bad allergy. He gets discharged from the Marine Corps. And they go, Hackett, we got one more slot for you if you want to go to the secret school. And I go, the secret school? What, what is that? He said, we can't tell you. That's why it's a secret school. And I go, All right, I'll, I'll, take the, I'll take the secret school. So off I go to the United States Army, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And I get in this room with uh, four other Marines. And there's a guy that looks like Beaker. And he's wearing a lab coat, and he comes up, and he goes, okay, you ready? And I go, ready for what? He goes, well, I want to show you why you're here. And he brings us into, the, into this room, and there's a tripod with a sheet on the top of it. And he pulls it off, and he goes, here it is. And we go, well, what the hell is it? And he goes, it's a people finder. A people and finder? Go, uh, yeah, people finder. What the hell is a people finder? He goes, it's a people finding radar you put this on the tripod you put some headphones on and you listen for the enemy uh, we go okay wait what's the range on this thing well you know we've been testing it out to about about 300 yards but most effective it's most effective about 100 to 150 feet <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I go, so I go, all right i went from being in the aviation radar, I'll have a beer, give, turn up the air conditioning, you know, a mortar. Okay, I'll listen for the mortars. And now I'm 100 feet away from the enemy with a, this piece of silliness on a, on a tripod. What have I got myself into? So anyway, that brought me up to my orders to go to Vietnam. Finally. <laughs> and, uh, finally. So you got you got half of my Marine Corps career there, and I can – Talk about what happened to me in Vietnam, uh, if you want to hear some more of this silly story. No, I mean, listen, it's it's very interesting how you managed, um, you know, I'm not saying to avoid, but I mean, clearly at that point in time, you know, people 
weren't lusting after slots in Vietnam, that's for sure. They were, they were forcibly being sent. And uh, the fact that your career, you know, and, and the path that you went on is, is uh, you know, very unique and, and, and very different, uh, but ultimately you end up in the same spot, which is, you know, where everybody ended up. Um, so kind of give me the story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, give me the story of, of what you were told and, and where you were going and how did you find all this stuff out? Yeah, exactly. And uh, you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head, Mark, because uh, we graduated 68 guys from my platoon in Paris Island. Of those 68 guys, we had 15 KIA, uh, 15 kill in action, including my senior drill instructor. So all those guys that I went through boot camp with, all those guys that I was fortunate enough to outshoot because my father showed me how to how to shoot the rifle, all those guys went to the uh, went to the infantry and uh, they caught the brunt of it. Uh, in nineteen, the latter part of nineteen sixty seven, and it's in nineteen sixty eight in Vietnam, the Marine Corps was having a tough time. We uh, the Third Marine Division was over there, and uh, we had some pretty difficult uh, issues happening. Uh, between the fact that uh, they issued us this uh, Mattel rifle, this M16, they took our M14s away from us, gave us this rifle that uh, did not function the way it should have. Uh, plus, given the political situation over there where our, our hands were basically tied, the Marine Corps has always been, uh, we're going to go in there and we're going to kick everybody's butt. We're going to take ground and then we're going to hand it off to the Army and go do it someplace else. That was the whole idea. The Marine Corps has never been uh, a service that was uh, the kind of service that would go and take some geographic area, secure it, and build it up and do all, everything else. No, we were in there just to kick some butt and then move on to the next place that yeah. we had to take care of business. The Army excels at occupying. So in, That's what they do really well. <laughs> the, in, in, indeed, indeed, indeed. So here we are. We land in Vietnam, and I'm talking a little bit before my time. And uh, it winds up to a situation where our hands are tied, where we couldn't do the type of operations we were trained and eager to do. We wound up uh, essentially circle, circling the wagons in, into fire bases and, and, and various areas throughout the northern part of South Vietnam at the time, which was called i -Corps. And uh, we would get a, what was called an AO, an area of responsibility, and we were responsible for that, and we'd run operations. But at the end of the day, we'd come back to our base camps and uh, basically set up and have a perimeter and wait for old Luke the Gook to come and attack us, which was uh, not, a, not a terrific way to run a, run a, uh, a war, such as it was. So anyway, long and short of it is I uh, – I get over to Vietnam in uh, the first part. I guess it was uh, February, March of uh, 1968, just after the Tet Offensive. And um, my first duty was in Da Nang. I wound up in the 1st Marine Division uh, with uh, a battalion of Marines, the 2nd Battalion 1st Marines. And we were located in a dry riverbed that was uh, about – 12 miles north of uh, Da Nang City. And uh, this area was uh, uh, a base that the infantry used to run operations around the local area and uh, try to secure the, the northern approaches to the Da Nang airfield because what would happen was the, uh, the North Vietnamese would come in and set up rocket systems. They were called uh, 122 millimeter Katyusha rocket systems provided by the Russians, I, I, I must tell you. And they would fire these rockets at the Da Nang Air Base, and it was my job and my group's job, uh, this counter-mortar anti-rocket system that I wound up working with to start to try to detect where these rockets were coming from. Um, and uh, so I, rank came pretty quickly to me. I was already a, an E-4 by the time I landed in Vietnam, and I rapidly made sergeant. Uh, I was a sergeant in, within three months of winding up in, in Vietnam. And I was fortunate enough to be assigned a team of Marines, about six or seven guys, to run these anti-personnel and counter-rocket counter -rocket mortar systems that we would encircle the Da Nang Air Base and go out to various fire bases and try to work with the artillery and do fire missions on uh, the enemy who was trying to fire at, at our positions. Um, Due to a lot of circumstances, mainly the fact that the, the equipment they were using 
was essentially Korean War vintage and hand-me-downs from the Army. It was all vacuum tube stuff. It worked really difficult to maintain in the field. And we had to run these big generators, which were very loud, so the enemy knew exactly where we were. And the larger systems were these big antennas that would wag back and forth and talk about a target. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, you look at a bunch of ragtag Marines and then you see this big thing wagging back and forth. That's the first thing you're going to shoot at. So that's that's how it worked for us. So I get out to this uh, fire base in my first week in Vietnam and uh, – uh, they said, okay, well, uh, tell you what you're going to have to do. You guys are going to have to pull some security because we may get hit. It might happen. We don't know. And sure enough, third night I'm there. Oh, something's going on. I get out there and hit the berm. So we go running out there and I throw my flak jacket on. I'm going to run out to this berm area, which was a, a dry riverbed that they pushed up all the sand. I think uh, they call them HESCO barriers now in, yep. uh, in Iraq and, yeah, and yeah. Afghanistan, but we didn't have anything like that, but we'd have bulldozers push up the dirt and that would be our berm. And, uh, so somebody says, Oh, we get gooks in the wire. Let's open up. So they start firing off their rounds and the guy next to me fires off a magazine out of his M16 and the, the brass goes flying up in the air and goes down the back of my flak jacket. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden I'm there on the line trying to find something to shoot at. I've been in country three days, and all of a sudden, this huge burning thing happens on my back, and I think I'm shot. I'm going, I'm shot. <laughs> I've been shot. Oh, no, man. I'm rolling on the ground. Hack, it's been shot. Oh, no. And the corpsman comes running over, and they rip my flak jacket off, and, and then they see the round, the, you know, the brass fall out of my, my uh, flak jacket. So that was <laughs> that was my introduction to the first time rounds went off but I thought I'd uh, I thought I'd been uh, been shot but actually what happened was I just got some hot brass down my neck I'm so sure you never lived that down oh no dude it was uh, it's uh, I'm <laughs> sure there's people that tell that story late at night uh, there was a lot of humiliating things that happened to me and I gotta tell you I was humbled by being in the company of some uh, really fine marines who pulled off some amazing amazing stuff but uh, the first uh, six to seven months was basically very frustrating, uh, finding out where the bad guys were, calling in fire missions, and they were long gone. The, uh, you've got to give uh, our enemy uh, at the time uh, enormous credit about how crafty they were, how smart they were, and their tactics they used against us. Uh, because we were in a static position most of the time, and because they were able to... Uh, own the night. We didn't have any night vision. We had no way of finding out what was going on at, at late at night. So we'd, we'd pull down and hunker down. We wouldn't patrol. We wouldn't get out there at night. And so they basically owned the night on us. Uh, you know, it's interesting, and, and because, Jim, that you point that out. Sorry to cut you off. Just the way you phrased that no, really, not at all. really struck something with me that, you know, we underestimated them. I, I don't think that's ever uh, recounted enough in military history or in history textbooks in general. Uh, part of the reason why Vietnam was such a slog, uh, outside of the political stuff that went on, but the actual military stuff that happened, uh, you're 100% correct. A lot of it was is we doubted the enemy. We looked at these people, these guys as inferior, and combine that with the terrain, the weather, uh, all those other factors that went into the whole thing. You know, we were climbing a much steeper hill than we had ever anticipated in fighting this enemy, and it's part of the reason why we had suffered so many casualties because we just weren't prepared. Uh, and I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think we underestimate enemies as much anymore, if at all, and we're trained not to. But I, I, that was the hard lesson from Vietnam in learning that. Well, you know, I think you're absolutely right, because uh, any student of military history will tell you, you know, they go back to the, the ancient days of Sun Tzu and uh, read uh, the, this Chinese uh, uh, strategy that he would come up with. He, basically, you'd never underestimate, underestimate your enemy. And we did. A lot of times we did. We'd say, you know, we're, we're badass Marines. I mean, you know, they got to be scared of us. I mean, they, they, they're not going to attack us. And you get into this complacent mode and things would start to get loose. And that's when bad things happened. And most of the bad things that happened to me while I was in Vietnam were directly, re, uh, directly related to that type of attitude that was going on with the troops and with the whole attitude about the war and the fact that we weren't being supported either by our 
uh, the people who were in charge of us or, or uh, in fact, uh, the people back home. Um, we, we underestimate our en- enemy quite, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, to a point where um, it, it became very difficult. A, a quick story I can tell you about that. Uh, fast forward a couple of uh, months, actually about almost a year. I spent almost two years in Vietnam. Uh, my job evolved two years into straight through that people. Yeah, I was almost okay. there 19 months straight okay. through. I had two R&Rs, which if I told you what I did in R&R, my wife would uh, probably uh, leave me right now. <laughs> but Guilty uh, as charged. A, a really, <laughs> indeed, indeed, we were all there. Um, but uh, when I first started there, it was you know trying to figure out what the heck I was doing with these uh, counter-mortar systems and trying to work with the artillery and trying to work something out and uh, – just because of the way the taxes were, things weren't going well. Um, then I got assigned to uh, a, a unit that was the, the most amazing bunch of guys I have ever seen. Uh, I got a call one day to come in to talk to this colonel. And he said, look, we, uh, we heard of it, that you got this little uh, box that finds the enemy called a people finder. I don't know. No, they found me out. Well, we want you to go out with the uh, first uh, recon battalion. Uh, we got uh, a bunch of recon teams out there that, uh, are now placed in a static position, uh, listing posts all the way around the Da Nang area, and they're sitting on top of mountaintops. And we're getting we're getting infiltration. We're getting people coming through the wire. And it'd be really great if we had some kind of an early warning system that we would say, hey, the you know the bad guys out there at the, you know 200 yards out there are dialing your machine guns. So I wound up going out with, uh, with, with the recon guys, and uh, I'm telling you something. Um, there are some unsung, amazing uh, people that uh, were running the recon teams in uh, both in uh, the 1st Marine Division and 3rd Marine Division. These guys were so badass, they'd fly out on ladders under helicopters, get inserted in the middle of nowhere, and live in the, in the bush for maybe almost two weeks at a time uh, with no backup nothing to back them up at all. And these guys would get in some horrendous battles. Fortunately for me, I wound up going out with them to some of their static positions. And we were able to set up on um, uh, this one hill, Hill 200 outside of Da Nang again. And uh, we were able to actually get this people finder to work. And uh, we were able to uh, dial in uh, a 50 caliber machine gun and also two M60s uh, to be able to shoot down the azimuth of this radar, and uh, we killed we killed a lot of people one night, and uh, it was probably the most amazing, uh, terrific night uh, uh, of my career in the Marine Corps. I was able to to say, okay, uh, hold your fire, hold your fire. You know the azimuth, you know the range. Hold your fire, hold your fire. Open up now, and we we wrecked them. We killed about twenty five people that night. It was pretty amazing. Wow. So anyway, coming off of that, um, coming off of that, and by the way, none of us got a scratch. None of us got uh, a scratch. Uh, we were able to put out all these rounds, take care of business, uh, uh, got a few pats on the back. Nothing happened to me. I was, I was now was into about 11 months in country and just doing fine. And I was going to take my first R and R in Thailand, and I was I was rare, raring to go, and I went over there and had a blast, and came back, and I said, you know, I'm really enjoying this stuff, the sensor stuff, and this people finder stuff. I'm starting to really think I'm doing something uh, that's making a difference. In this so uh, uh, they said, okay, uh, you know, you can extend your tour another six months, and. Uh, you know, we'll make you a staff sergeant and, uh, you know, you do this and you do that. And, uh, uh, and before you go, we want you to head up this team. We're having a little problem with this one team in a place called LZ Ross, which was a fire base that was previously uh, occupied by the Army that the Marine Corps took over. And it was at the southern part of the Da Nang AR. It was way, way south. And I went down there, and unfortunately, I started to see some things that were that were really bad about what was happening in Vietnam. The morale was not all that terrific. It's now to the point where people are starting to question, you know, what what are we doing here? They're, we're starting to hear about, you know, some of the protests back in the United States. And we had a lot of issues with, uh, with race 
you know, why am I going to die in a white man's war? I don't want to go out and patrol. I don't want to do this. There's a lot of dope smoking, a lot of uh, drug abuse, uh, a lot of uh, disciplinary problems. And, you know, this was not the Marine Corps I was brought up to, to, to enjoy and love. This was something else. We had draftees in our, in our pool now. Marines were actually drafted in the Marine Corps and not very happy to be there. Plus, we got a bunch of guys, uh, new guys in. Uh, here I am, a sergeant, and I got a bunch of lance corporals in from the states. And, and I, you got you, tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to fill sandbags, and we're going to we're going to reinforce our position here, and we're going to do that. Oh, sergeant, yeah, come on! Why, why do they work so hard? I said, look, just do what I tell you. I'm the sergeant. You're the lance corporal. You're the private. You're going to fill these sandbags. And you're going to do what I'm telling you because. I had been brought into uh, a briefing um, at the the battalion uh, uh, battalion command post uh, one night, and uh, they said, you know, we've got a main force VC cadre in the area. Ali North uh, was running a, a bunch of Marines to the south of us, and he was doing a great job. He was kicking some serious butt, and they felt that uh, we might get – it's some sort of uh, an attack on uh, LZ Ross in the next week or two. So I went back to my guys, let's fill some sandbags. And here, here's a trick I'm going to show you guys. This is something I learned when I was up north, up in Kantian. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our ammo bandoliers. Uh, the, uh, uh, it was a cloth bandolier that had six or seven pockets in it that had paper uh, containers that held our, 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 uh, two, two, three rounds uh, in stripper clips. I said, okay, take those out, you know, put them where you can find them, load up all your magazines. And in the empty ban bandoliers, I want you to put five M26 frag fragmentation grenades in these, uh, in these bandoliers. And I want you to put them on the end of each, each of the two tents that we're occupying, because if we get hit, we're going to run into our fighting bunkers and our fighting holes that we just dug in, in, uh, in our bunkers. And you're going to, as you go out the tent, grab a bandolier of, uh, of grenades so you'll have some grenades to go to war with. And they're going, well, you know, okay, we'll do this. And one lance corporal says, you know, Sarge, you know, I don't think that's a really good idea. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, you know, you take these grenades and you take them out of their, this cardboard box and put them in a cloth bandolier. What if, what if they fall out on the ground and they, they'll go off? I go, just do what I tell you to do. Just shut up and do what I tell you to do. So sure enough, about uh, five days later, I'm asleep. It's one o'clock in the morning, and uh, I get blown out of my rack. A huge explosion. Uh, a couple of mortar rounds hit us, and then a tremendous blast goes off in my little CP tent. It was myself and another sergeant, a guy named Sergeant Jim Bailey, uh, just a terrific guy, and he was to my right, and he had built a bookcase uh, between us with a bunch of magazines about Australia. He loved Australia. He wanted to marry an Australian woman. He was crazy about Australia. And we got hit with uh, uh, a, a, a unit called a sapper unit. Uh, a couple of sappers came through. And what these guys were were North Vietnamese that would strip down. They would cover themselves in cosmoline and grease and wear a loincloth and carry uh, satchels full of explosive charges called satchel charges and their job was to sneak through our barbed wire and uh, wiggle through the barbed wire be very quiet and uh, come through our area and would throw these explosives into our tents and of course we got this big radar whacking back and forth and this generator going on so we don't hear anything so this satchel charge comes into our tent and fortunately for me and unfortunately for Jim Bailey the satchel charge went off on his side of this bookshelf, messed him up pretty bad, took part of his arm off, uh, wounded me. Uh, not so badly. I got sh some shrapnel on my butt and my leg, and <laughs> the next thing I know, I, this tent is down around me, and I'm hearing Vietnamese voices, and I'm hearing AKs going off, and I'm going, what's, what's up with this? So I take a quick peek outside the tent, and dude, we're overrun. We've got we got enemy running through our area, guys with AKs oh running God. past us, and we're, we're overrun. And uh, so I go to my go to my buddy Jim and put my hands on him, and 
he was barely conscious and he was hurting pretty bad. And he was, he was, he was actually uh, very loudly uh, making it known that he was in pain. I said, Jim, you, you got to be quiet. You got to, you got to calm it down, dude. So I get him out of there and get him over a fighting hole and he's bleeding really badly from his, from his right arm. And um, um, so I did the first thing I was thinking of was, I, you know, I got to put a bandage on him. So I, I grabbed a field dressing that I had on my belt and was trying to wrap it around his arm. And, and he says, we, hey, hack, will you do me a favor? And I go, what's that? And he goes, will you point that 45 someplace else? And I realized I had my 45 out. It was cocked and locked. The safety's off. And while I'm bandaging him with my left hand, I've got my 45 right in his face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, <laughs> Would you just do me a favor and kind of move that 45 out yeah. of my face? The, the bleeding from oh my, my arm is God. going to be the second problem if that thing goes off in my face. <laughs> it, it, exactly. exactly. And I'm thinking, my God, I, I could have shot the guy. So anyway, the, the insanity continues. We're taking rounds now from both sides. Uh, the, the Marines, uh, we were right on our perimeter, so we're overrun. The enemy's past us, and they're fighting the Marines past us. The Marines are fighting back at us. And they're firing rounds at the enemy, and it's going over our heads. So we're we're in a world of hurt. So I looked at my guys, my my five guys on my radar team, and I looked at them, and I go, "Where's your weapons?" And none of them had any weapons. I said, "You know, where's your weapons?" They, were, well, you know, our tent blew up, and we didn't know what to do, so we jumped in the fighting. I said, "Go back to the tents and get your damn weapons, and and get me some grenades, because these guys are running around." So they go go back in the tent, and they to drag back a bunch of stuff and I'm snooping and we're looking around and I had to look over the, the lip of my fighting hole and, and, and I see three North Vietnamese sappers and they're, they're throwing these satchel charges at our radar system and a big radar, a big radio uh, antenna we had. Boom. These things are going up. Boom. I didn't mention it was raining. And it was, the reason it was, I'm going to mention it's raining is I probably saved my life. Anyway, so they're throwing this stuff around. I went, holy jeez. So I grabbed my M16, and there's old saying in the Marine Corps, when in doubt, empty the magazine. <laughs> so yeah. So I pulled up my M16, and, man, I, I let fly 20 rounds, and I didn't hit any of them. <laughs> oh, God. I might have been the outstanding shot in my platoon, but, dude, man, I, I just I, – I, they all looked at me like, who are you, you know, and I – and so one of them throws a grenade at me, and the grenade hits the edge of the, the fighting hole, bounces off, and boom, goes off and catches me on the side of my face with some shrapnel. I go, well, that wasn't very polite. So I grab a bandolier that I had these guys fill up with grenades and rip the M26 out of there, pull the pin and throw the grenade back. I'm throwing, you know, giving them a favor, throwing, you know, giving them the favor right back, and and the grenade doesn't go off. I go, what? What's up with this? I pull another one out, pull the pin, throw it. I, I throw three grenades, and none of them go off. And this Lance Corporal pulls on my sleeve, Sarge, Sarge, I know it's wrong. I go, what do you mean you know what's wrong? He goes, I know what's wrong with the grenades. So what's, what's wrong with the grenades? He goes, remember, remember you had us put in the, in the bandoliers, and I was afraid if they fell out of the bandoliers, they, they'd go off? I go, yeah. He goes, well, I took some electrical tape and I taped up all the spoons and the grenades to be safe. Oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I want to take my 45 out and shoot this guy, but I had him unwrap a couple of grenades and we threw them and, uh, and that, that was the end of that problem. Uh, that night was uh, a real epiphany for me. I wanted to make the Marine Corps a uh, career. I was really dialed into it but after leading that motley crew and having that happen after all that preparation and all this kind of a total cluster happened uh, i felt really really bad not only did i feel bad about it but that was the first night i prayed for the sun to come up uh if you've been in combat and you've been in combat at night and you've been through a night there are some other things about that i haven't talked about but uh we lost a total of 14 Marines that night and over 40 were wounded. Um, that night was uh, a very, very difficult night for me. Um, 
and I still talk about it when I'm at the VA. <laughs> so that night uh, kind of made me feel that uh, maybe perhaps the, the Marine Corps is not a not a career option for me, but I'm going to get through this the best I can. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, everybody can learn something from it. But that was the first night that I, the first time I had been close before, I'd taken incoming, I'd been shot at a couple of times, you know, a couple of things would happen, a couple of mortar rounds would go off. This is the first concerted effort that the North Vietnamese had to try and kill me many, many times that night. And, um, you know, you sit there and you, you, you pray for the sun to come up. You want the sun to come up. That's all you want to see because, you know, we ruled the day, but we did not rule the night at the time. So the sun did come up and um, I looked around my area and all my stuff was blown to hell. We had a beautiful shower that I had built out of an F4 wing tank and the Vietnamese blew that up. They blew my radar up. They blew my generator up. They fortunately, they didn't kill any of my guys. Uh, Jim Bailey uh, was medevaced that day and I got medevaced medevac later that day. But uh uh, of course, the guy with the, the who taped up the grenades, uh, he wasn't wounded. He didn't get a scratch. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Just, let me ask you, Jim, uh, real quick. Just, let, me, let me ask you, you. You mentioned twice. Once your recruiter ended up saving your life because he got you for a four-year deal, and you mentioned the rain saved your life. What happened? Recruiter probably saved my life because uh, he had signed me up for four years. And because I was one of the few, of, uh, probably the only recruit in my uh, platoon in boot camp that had a four-year enlistment, I think the Marine Corps realized they could send me to a school and train me up on something versus having just two or three years in, in the Marine Corps. Then you'd go right to the infantry. So that that kind of, I think he really saved my life in the sense that, yeah, I almost got myself killed, but I was not. Uh, in a rice paddy every single day like sure. some of these okay. poor guys were. Yeah. So that was the one thing. And then the other question you had was uh, somebody else saved my life? You said the rain. It was raining and that saved your life. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, thank you for that, too. One of the things I didn't mention was uh, uh, these uh, sappers uh, were very well prepared for us. Uh, they had prepared a lot of improvised explosives. They were satchel charges, which were dynamite charges. They also would make hand grenades out of Coke cans and out of uh, tin cans, sea ration cans. And what happened the next morning when the light came up, we looked around our area and there was all this unexploded ordnance laying around. In fact, five feet from me was a six foot long Bangalore torpedo. Wow. Uh, I don't know if you know what those are. Yeah, I mean. Uh, that did not go off. They had shoved it under uh, our fighting hole to try and blow us out of there while we're having our little hand grenade to duel. And because it was raining that night, their ordnance got wet and a lot of this stuff didn't go off. So here's another embarrassing thing. So it's the morning and I'm looking around and, and I suddenly realize I've got three hand grenades laying out on the ground in front of us that have electrical tape on them. And it's wet, and the tape's going to get loose, and those grenades are going to go off. I don't know when, but they're going to go off. So I get on the horn, and I call up the EOD guys. Now, here's somebody who I have a lot of respect for. The guys that go out and uh, you know take care of mines and, and unexploded uh, mortar rounds and that type of stuff. And this gunnery sergeant comes out, and he's looking around the area, and he says, geez, he goes, you know, you are you are you are one lucky son of a bitch because you should be dead. Because look at all the stuff laying around you. It didn't go off because it got wet. And he said, "And by the way, Sergeant, what's the deal with these grenades with the tape on them?" <laughs> <laughs> that is great. <laughs> so I didn't know. I don't know what I said to that guy, but I know my face was red when I when I came back to him. Wow, that's so. A continuing on. With my uh, illustrious career in the Marine Corps, uh, went on that R and R to Thailand, had a great time. Came back and was told essentially what's going on is the Third Marine Division is pulling out, and actually the First Marine Division is going to be pulling out too because Nixon had basically said, "Okay, uh, we're done with uh, with this, and we're now in a situation where we're not going to be doing much offensive work. It's all going to be defensive." 
So there's Sergeant Hackett. you got to get up on the DMZ there and put these sensors up along the DMZ while we pull the, uh, the division out. And uh, so I got the opportunity to go up right on the DMZ to a place called Contien and also a place called uh, Charlie 2 and Charlie 1 and Rock Pile and Vandegrift Combat Base and Camp Carroll and a, couple, and a bunch of other places where we would set these sensors up to tell us if the enemy was uh, coming across the DMZ. And while we were setting these sensors and our radar systems up, um, the division's pulling out. Now, if you can imagine how stupid this deal is, the DMZ at the time uh, was a an area that we could not enter, we couldn't fire into. If we saw enemy across the, the DMZ walking around in their uniforms, driving tanks, uh, driving trucks, we couldn't shoot at them. They could, we could only shoot at them if they had came over the DMZ. So consequently, they would do all kinds of things to really piss us off. One of the things that really ticked me off was at Contien. They would, they would have this large North Vietnamese flag on a flagpole. <laughs> they would run it up the flagpole and have it waving at us because they knew that we, we couldn't shoot at them. Just to rub it so, in your face, uh, right? Yeah, and we couldn't take it out. So we had a, a battery of of eight-inch uh, howitzers, self-propelled howitzers at the time. And they got the orders that, you know, you're pulling out. So the battery commander, great captain, he was, he was a great guy. He says, all right, here's what we're going to do. Took one of his eight-inch guns, and he bore-sighted it, which means that you actually look down the barrel of this artillery piece, and he, he centers this flagpole <laughs> right in the center of his eight-inch artillery piece. And he says, I want you to load up HE. He loads up HE. And he, I don't know how many bags of powder he used, but a huge charge. And the last thing they did before they pulled out of Contient was pull a lanyard on that eight inch, eight inch gun and blow that flagpole. <laughs> the kingdom come. And there were some pretty happy Marines that day. That was a lot of fun to see that. But uh, after the artillery pulls out, uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of uh, bad weather. And in weather, we couldn't fly any uh, any of our air assets. And consequently, uh, the North Vietnamese said, gee, this is great. Uh, we have no more artillery that can shoot at us, so we're going to start moving some troops in the DMZ. And so one night I'm on one of my systems, and we get getting all this movement. We've got trucks. We've got PT-76 tanks. We've got troops in the open. And I get on the radio. I have fire mission, fire mission, and Anybody out there, fire mission? I'm looking for somebody to buy off on this fire mission. Usually the, I could get uh, some air assets, either Navy or Marine Corps Air, or I could get uh, artillery, but they're all gone. So this uh, this voice comes up on the radio, and I, I can't remember his call sign. I'll call him Orange 6 for whatever reason. This is Orange 6. So I go, well, Orange 6, I got a fire mission. What do you got? Troops in the open. I got PT-76 tanks. I got tr I got trucks. He goes, give me the coordinates. I give him the coordinates. He's, 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 what do you got for me? He goes, how about 16-inch naval gunfire? It's the battleship New Jersey. <laughs> oh, my. So we got a fire mission from the battleship New Jersey that night, and we heard 16-inch naval gun gunfire going overhead. Those rounds were as big as a Volkswagen, 16-inch diameter, and those the same uh, the same rounds that uh, they used in World War II against the Japanese. And I'm going to tell you something that was pretty amazing. And we also got to work with the B-52s. They would we would do things called arc light strikes, where they would we'd get a grid coordinates where we had troops in the open, or we had some indication of enemy movement. And uh, the Air Force would come in, and we wouldn't see them. But all of a sudden, the ground would start shaking, and this these lights would come up like an aurora, aurora borealis in the distance, and the ground would shake. And we would be sitting on top of our bunkers in lawn chairs, in shorts, drinking beer, watching B-52 airstrikes. It was amazingly awesome. And the most ridiculous thing about it all was – we had Armed Forces Radio and TV at the time, so because of, we had all this electronics, I had a generator, and we had a TV. 
So we'd be able to watch Armed Forces radio and TV on top of this bunker, watching B-52 strikes in the distance. And one night we're doing it, and what's playing but Star Trek? <laughs> we've, got, we've got Star Trek on on the Armed Forces Radio. Was it Star Trek? Maybe it wasn't Star Trek. What, what the heck was it? It was some kind of ridiculous space show, and we're watching that. So talk about a strange, uh, surreal... You, you, couldn't, you couldn't write this stuff it was a, if it was a movie. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So uh, it was, it was uh, pretty amazing. So anyway, I finished out my, my tour in, in uh, Vietnam. I got wounded again. Uh, another strange circumstance, uh, took some, uh, took some shrapnel from a B-40 rocket. I think it was a B-40. It might've been an RPG, uh, but I'm not really sure. Um, and, uh, was able to finish up my tour in August of 1970. And at that time, uh, the war was really winding down. Uh, morale was in the toilet. Uh, all I wanted to do was get back to the United States and get out of the Marine Corps. And I got back to San Diego and got discharged there. And uh, we were told, you know, just don't wear a uniform in the airport. Uh, so I wound up sticking my uniform in my sea bag and putting all my crap in there and uh, heading out to the airport, fly back to New York to my see my dad because they were still living in uh, the house I grew up in. And got home about 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, walked in the house and walked into the back of my house, into the kitchen. And there's my dad sitting at the kitchen table and he's got a can of Schaefer beer and he's watching uh, watching the uh, New York Yankees on black and white TV. And he says, you want a beer? And I went, yeah, okay. And I had a beer with him and he didn't ask me about it. He didn't want to know anything about it. He just knew it was kind of messed up. And that's how I finished my Marine Corps career, drinking the Schaefer beer with my dad in front of a black and white TV, watching the New York Yankees. Did he? Did you ever talk about it with him after the fact? Yeah, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, his 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 situation was he hated anything to do with the Japanese. He hate, he would not eat rice if he knew I owned a Toyota truck, he'd roll over in his grave. Oh, God. <laughs> he could not stand the Japanese. He did some Japanese. He went through some serious stuff in World War II, and, you know, back in those days, they never heard of PTSD. Sure. He just had yeah. a, he just had to swallow it and deal with it and, and get on with his life. And so we had one or two talks about it. He, I said to him, you know, I really wanted to stay in the Marine Corps. I wanted to follow in your steps. Uh, you won a bronze star and, uh, you know, I, I was nominated for a bronze star, but they reduced it to a Navy commendation medal. And I got two of those and he went, yeah. And he goes, you put it in the drawer and you forget about it. And he said, but one thing I want you to do. I said, what's that daddy? He said, I want you to go down to the VA and I want you to, uh, get your disability. I said, this, what's this? What? He said, no, no, they'll pay you for your wounds. You got wounded in the leg and in your, in your back and your, in your butt go down there and tell them, you know, you got wounded. So I went, all right, all right. So this is 1970. So I go down to the VA and, and the VA in 1970 was like a descent into hell. It was just, I just the worst thing you could ever think of. So nothing's that. changed essentially. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could have that discussion. I mean, we could have that discussion, but when I went down there, here's how they, figured out your disability. They went, okay, you're wounded. Where were you wounded? Well, in the leg and the arm and the back. And I got this, okay, uh, drop your drawers. And they pull out a tape measure and they measure your scars. And depending on the length of your scars, if your scars were less than six inches, you got nothing. You got something over six inches of scars, you got 10%. So I got a 10% disability starting in 1970, which equated to, I think at the time was $22 a month. And that lasted me up until about four years ago when I was walking through a car show and I had my Marine Corps cover on uh, showing the colors. And this guy came up to me and said, hey, I, I, I'm with the vet center. Are you a Marine? I go, well, yeah, I was. We in Vietnam? Yeah. He says, well, you hurt? And I go, well, a little bit, not too bad. He goes, well, what happened? I said, well, I got, got wounded here and I got wounded there. And he goes, you have a purple heart? I go, yeah, I had two of them. He goes, 
and do you have a disability? I went, yeah. I said, I got 10%. <laughs> Get your ass in here. And he drags me into this van and he sits down and we fill out all this paperwork. And uh, uh, so I, I can say that I'm um, now uh, receiving a disability for my wounds and a few other physical thing elements that are tracked to that, uh, to my wonderful exposure to Agent Orange. And, uh, and the VA is uh, kind of taking care of me now, which is kind of a good thing. Well, and, and, um, and you know, I, that's, you're right on with the time frame. It took about 40 years, so you're right on with the normal time frame of how the VA works as far as speed is concerned. So everything is status quo. Yeah, it, exactly. And, you know, when you get to the VA, now I'm 70 years old, um, and I get to the VA and I see, you know, guys who are, uh, you know, a lot younger than I am. And uh, going through a lot of the stuff that we went through and, and getting some attention paid to them, but not as much attention as you think they should have and they, and they deserve. Um, and it's, it's, it's real hard for me to sit down and, and talk to and, – and, and, and I think there's the same thing that happened to, between Vietnam veterans and, and World War II veterans. Our war was viewed by – World War II veterans as a losing war. We lost the war. Uh, you know, I, I, as much as I can say to these guys, I have news for you. We won the war in 1968. We kicked their butt. I mean, seriously, we had the war won. The politicians lost it. The, the guy that went out there and put his life on the line in a rice paddy, who grabbed that M16 and, and just took that hill he is as much of a hero and has, has as much respect due to him as any other veteran. But because of the political situation at the time, we didn't get that type of attention. And when the Vietnam veterans would go into like a VFW or to uh, you know one of the other uh, service clubs, they were basically ostracized. They, you know, we don't want you, you in here. You guys lost your war. So consequently, we never engaged with those World War II veterans like we were starting to do now. Which brings me up to a very important thing that I, I want to talk a little bit about. And I've been running off the mouth here like crazy, so slow me down if, if I no, have it's, to. No, it's perfect. Go ahead. But uh, about a year and a half ago, I got involved with a uh, with a guy named Bill Reynolds, who you inter interviewed on your program. Yeah, previous Hazard yeah, Zone guest. Great yeah, great guy. Yeah. And he said to me, hey, I'm working with a foundation called the Greatest Generations Foundation. And we're bringing people – bringing veterans back to Vietnam for a little closure and, and, and some camaraderie and, and bringing guys together to talk about that experience. Are you interested? Oh, well, yeah. So through this uh, foundation, uh, I was brought back to Vietnam uh, for a week with a bunch of, some, with a bunch of some hard charging Marines and uh, got to know the founder of the foundation a guy by the name of Timothy Davis who for the last 12 years has been bringing World War II veterans back to uh, Normandy and Europe. And because of the age of that population and the fact that that's changing over now, he's he made a determination to start involving Vietnam veterans doing the same, same thing. And um, I just returned uh, two weeks ago, actually three weeks ago, from my fourth trip to Vietnam – with the uh, with the foundation, and uh, this time we went back with fourteen veterans who uh, <clears throat> were all in the Marine Corps and all uh, fought uh, in the way uh, the battle for Way, which was fifty years ago, and also in the Tet Offensive. Uh, we had two Silver Star winners. Every we had fifteen Purple Hearts amongst the fifteen the guys that were there, and one guy in particular, Joe Getherall, is. Uh, has a bill in uh, Congress right now to upgrade his Silver Star to the Medal of Honor. So talk about some amazing guys who I would think would be perfect for your program. I think Joe Getherall would be an amazing guest, and I'll turn you on to him a little later on if you care to. But this association, pardon me, this foundation is out there actively soliciting Vietnam veterans who would benefit from an all-expense-paid trip to back to Vietnam. We stay in five-star hotels. The program is just amazing. You get to go to the areas that you want to go to. It's not a tour. You say, hey, listen, I got wounded at the Alcal Bridge in uh, February of 1968, and I'd like to go back to that spot. They go, 
fine, you're gone. Boom, you go back there. I got to go back to LZ Ross to the exact place where my buddy Jim lost part of his arm and where I got myself messed up pretty badly and where he had that silly hand grenade battle with this guy. And I actually stood on the same ground I did back in 1969, which was just amazing. Next to it, of course, what's happened in Vietnam, uh, all of the the fortifications and everything that was American is long gone. Right. Um, what's what's happened is they'll 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 put in some uh, uh, you know uh, Buddhist temples and and memorials to the battles and what have you, but there's nothing that as as it was. I mean, if you expect to go back and say, oh, there's not my bunker and there's a no, that's long gone. Next to the place where L.Z. Ross was, was a memorial uh, for the North Vietnamese who had been killed there on that day. And it was listed by by date. So I could go to the actual date and see 40 or 50 names of the exact date when this battle at L.Z. Ross took place and realize that some of those guys were, were the guys that I took out. Mm-hmm. And I'm standing there looking at this, and this caretaker person comes up. He's about my age. Of course, he's Vietnamese. I, it's really hard to say how old they are. And he looked at me, and he said, Marine, Marine, you Marine? I went, yeah, yeah, I'm a Marine. But yeah, me, VC, VC. Oh, and I said, you remember this date? Uh, yes, I remember. I remember. And I'm blown away. Here I am standing next to a guy that uh, – I, I was trying to kill him back in the day, and he was trying to kill me. And we're looking at each other, and one of the guys from the foundation said, uh, I got an idea. He gets on his cell phone. He calls back to the United States to his Vietnamese girlfriend. <laughs> she picks up the phone, and she's now translating between this VC guy and myself. And I, you know, I, I didn't know what to say to the guy. I said to him, you know, I, I, I must tell you, uh, I have to say that you were a worthy adversary and I have respect for you. And the translation came back. What he said, he says, you were a worthy opponent and I'm glad we're now friends. Wow. And man, that powerful blew me away. Uh, it just blew me away. So that's the kind of closure I've been able to get through the foundation. And um, anyway, if your listeners, if you're at all interested in, in this, if you're a Vietnam veteran, it's uh, in a website called um, – it's uh, www.tggf.org. That's Tom George George Frank.org. And take a peek at the website. Uh, there's a place you can register – uh, your interest in going back. I believe that we've got about 12 programs planned over the next 12 to 14 months. Uh, we've got an all helicopter pilot uh, program going back. Uh, we have another set of Marines going back. We have uh, Central Highlands people. We've got the 12th Infantry. We've got the 9th Infantry Division and a bunch of 101st Airborne. The 83rd Airborne, uh, all these guys, we're going to make an effort to bring back groups of veterans, 14 to 15 at a time, all expenses paid. You won't want for anything. You'll eat and dine with uh, some fantastic people, and it'll be an experience you'll never forget. (laughs) One last aside about this. When we can't come back uh, into Los Angeles, because that's where we fly, we generally fly from Los Angeles to uh, Seoul, Korea, and then Korea to Da Nang or Saigon, as the case may be. On the way back, uh, some of the some of the guys, um, the veterans, are retired law enforcement. So when we get back, we're greeted at the at the gate by. Uh, U.S. Customs, and they'll tell everybody on this plane, this big A380 jumbo jet, to stay in your seats, and the following people will exit the plane now. So all the veterans get up. There's 15 of us. We get out of the plane first. We march through Customs with not a problem, and they have the fire trucks out there, you know, with things spraying just like we're the honor flight. And um, 
all of the airport police greet us, and it's uh, it's just pretty pretty amazing way to end an uh, experience like that. So that's the kind of stuff you can expect that the uh, Greatest Generations Foundation will do for you. Well, Jim, so I urge your listeners to check it out. Jim, you've told an amazing story, just such incredible detail, and certainly very eloquently done. And I don't I don't want to you know do it any discredit because you. You've said everything that needs to be said about this whole thing. I, I certainly just appreciate your experience and, uh, and your candor and honesty. And obviously, thank you for all that you've done uh, for your service. And, uh, you know, best wishes because I hope everything is, is okay now. I know some of this stuff still will stick with you as, as it will with me and people of my generation who went into combat, you know, 30, 40 years down the road. This stuff will stay with us forever. But uh, you certainly have uh, done well by your fellow Marines and by your fellow Vietnam service members and, and everything that you've done since then. Well, Mark, uh, thank you again for letting me uh, spout a little bit. Uh, I think I ran off the mouth quite a bit, but, you know, sometimes after 40, I, I never talked about this stuff for 40, 50, 50 years now. So it's it's great to get it out. It's great to share it with a federal, fellow veteran who's been there, who's seen the elephant like you guys have. And and I feel very selfish for not asking you to talk about some of your experiences as well with me. But I have a chance that I have a feeling that uh, I'm going to go back and listen to some of the, some of your broadcasts so I can catch up with uh, some of your experiences. And thanks so much for doing this for, the, for your fellow veterans. Uh, I know they appreciate it. And uh, all I want to say is Semper Fidelis. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.